do not give up on yourself. It, it is not an easy road. And there's going to be days, you know, that you may want to give up. But there's got to be that power inside of you that fights that you're going to get through it. And as far as not being a victim, you've got to associate yourself with people that truly care. Hello, and thank you for joining our podcast, Hope to Recharge, a show that is designed to bring hope, inspiration, motivation, and some practical tips to those that are battling depression and anxiety, and to those that are supporting loved ones that are going through the journey in this difficult time of depression and anxiety. I'm here to tell you, you are not alone, and we will live beyond depression and anxiety. We will share our stories one story at a time in a world of mental health together is better. I'm your host, Matana. Thank you for tuning in. Before we continue, I would like to announce our sponsor, BetterHelp.com. I myself just started with BetterHelp.com. I'm excited to start with my new therapist. It's going to be very convenient for me because I travel a lot. I also have some time in the evenings that I can work and most therapists do not see past 8 p.m. BetterHelp.com is an online platform over 4,000 therapists and you can choose the one that is matching for you. It's affordable. It's accessible. It's convenient. It's secure. You can text them. You can chat with them. You can video call them. You can use your tablet, your computer, your phone. It's on the tip of your fingers. You don't have to travel anywhere. If you're remote and you're looking for a therapist, then maybe your community doesn't have someone local that is specific therapist for what you need. Why not sign up on betterhelp.com and get the therapist that fits your needs. It's also super private. You don't have to go anywhere and be seen in public if you're still struggling with stigma. So visit betterhelp.com. That's betterhelp.com forward slash hope to recharge. They're offering our listeners 10% off on their first month. So go to betterhelp.com forward slash hope to recharge. Find your therapist. Hello and welcome to Hope to Recharge. Thank you for joining me here today. Today, we are going to speak to somebody that is changing the world in a way that is one of my biggest dreams to bring awareness to the world. I'm speaking today to Miss Oz, aka Tammy, and she is a phenomenal human being. Phenomenal. Why did I call her Miss Oz? Because she is a teacher. She's an educator. And not only is she an educator, she is somebody that connects to children and to maybe even young adults in a way that most human beings don't see. And after speaking to her for a short conversation, I don't really know her. She reached out to me after she heard her friend speak on our podcast. She said that she can add to the conversation. And after we spoke a little bit, I'm like, this is, this is it. This is what we need to speak about. And uh, Miss Oz has this special, unique gift of not being afraid to talk about her mental health, even though she's an educator. So first of all, welcome to our show. Thank you so much for making time. It's yes. the end of vacation. The yes. most stressful time for teachers. <laughs> Talk about devotion and dedication. Thank you for joining me here. Thank you for making time, Miss Oz. Thank you for having me. Should I call you Miss Oz or Tammy? Whatever you want. Or Whatever. both. Or both. <laughs> okay, so we're going to go back and forth. And I like the word Miss Oz because it's, what's your real last name? Oslins. It's an it's a nickname. Miss Oz is a nickname and it just shows a little bit of Miss Oz's personality that she's not like, I'm the teacher, you're the student, give me respect. She's like, let's make it fun. Let's make yes. it a relationship. Let, we're, we're all humans. We're all here together. And what struck me with the, our conversation was that you had this humbleness about you that you just want to give to the children. You want to see them, you want to understand them, and you want to make an impact in their life. Yes, for so, sure. Yes. And, and it's a gift. I really think it's a gift. Thank you. Were you always like that as a little girl? When you were growing up, did you have a mentor in your life, a teacher or something, but buddy like that, that was making an impression that you said, I'm going to be like that when I grow older? Yes, I had my um, one I remember mostly is my English teacher, uh, Mr. Muehlberg. Um, he just uh, he just cared. and He just kind of let us do be our own person. And like, for example, um, I we had to do an essay and I did mine on street fighting. 
And he's like, okay. And then I brought in this little pop-up thing and I kind of just did some kickboxing moves and things like that while I was doing my essay and presenting it. And he just let us be who we wanted to be. I mean, we had to still follow protocol and obviously learn English and all that. And as long as it was in the English format and how he wanted it, that's what I loved about him because he was this goofy. He would stand on the desks and he would just have such confidence in you. You just couldn't help leave his class happy. Wow. So he was really a role model in your mm -hmm. life. Yep. Did you know that you'll become a teacher when you were his student? No, actually, my my dream uh, in my yearbook, I put I wanted to be an athletic trainer. Mm -hmm. And my dream was to be an athletic trainer for my favorite football team, which is the San Francisco 49ers. Mm -hmm. um, so I started out in college with athletic training with a concentration in health and PE. Um, and I really thought I was going to be like more of a strength and conditioning coach. Um, but as I started to go into athletic training, it was more hands-on and I was just more bored, to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. I needed to be more active. Mm -hmm. So then um, I think it was my freshman, towards the end of my freshman year, I decided it wasn't for me. So I continued with the teaching aspect. Oh, wow. So that's a little bit of a background on, on your job and how you got to it. So mm -hmm. give us a little bit of a background. Where did you grow up? I'm originally from Buffalo, New York, um, but now I live in Richmond, Virginia. I have, my parents were married for 52 years. Wow. Uh, matter of fact, today would have been my dad's 80th birthday, but unfortunately he passed two years ago. Mm -hmm. So it was our second birthday without him. Um, but I have four brothers mm -hmm. and out of the four, one is my twin. Oh, you're a twin. Yes. I didn't know that. Yes. I'm five minutes older. You're five minutes older. Are you the oldest in the family? No, we're the youngest. You're the youngest. Okay. Wow. So you have a twin and you, are you best friends with your twin? Yes. I always tell people, you know, the best thing about twins is you're born with the best friend. Yes. And we're just, I mean, we just, I mean, I pretty much talk to him every day and sometimes two or three times throughout the day. And when he, he actually first moved down to Richmond first. Mm. And so I think we spent like a year or two years apart, which was really tough. Um, and, you know, when they talk about twins and say how you do everything together and um, even though we were apart, I'll never forget on my mom's birthday, like two years in a row, we bought her both the same card. Without, I mean, without planning. With, exactly. Yep. Wow. <laughs> yep. Wow. So he lives near you now? Yes. He's about, about 30 minutes away from me now. So that's fabulous. That is yes. fabulous. So you grew up in Buffalo, which is freezing cold. Yes. Um, talk about mental health in the cold is not something that helps us, right? Right. I, I um, didn't realize that the uh, winter months would really affect my mental health in the sense that I noticed when it got darker, I would start to go more into depression. Mm -hmm. So I didn't realize the thing, the seasonal affective disorder existed until some uh, one of the doctors told me. So for me right now, even here in Richmond, um, starting in October, I will start um, an antidepressant. Mm -hmm. And I will take that until probably about March, April, right. when the sun starts coming out more because the darkness does really affect my mood. Right. So I'm going to go into the whole medication and your story soon, but mm -hmm. I just want to give the audience a background on um, how we came to speaking about mental health. So Miss mm -hmm. uh, Oz told me that even though she's a teacher, she does not shy away from the topic of her battle with mental health, her depression, anxiety. Is it bipolar? Yes, bipolar to the rapid cycling. Okay, so can you give the audience a little bit of a description of what bipolar 2 is and how you were diagnosed? So bipolar 2 for me, the rapid cycling is where I get highs and lows. Um, sometimes it can happen within hours. Sometimes it's within days. So basically it's a mania. And then sometimes I'll just go into depression. But what happens, it happens, like I said, throughout the day. So that's why it's called rapid cycling, because I'll just change rather quickly. Um, and sometimes I don't, you know, don't know when it's coming. And sometimes I can feel the change. Um, like a perfect example would be when I was younger, my mom would always laugh and joke and say, will the real Tammy come back? because I would go to the bathroom happy as a bird. And then sometimes I would come out just very irritable. And that's how, how quickly I would change. 
So, and that's when I was diagnosed back in Buffalo um, with that diagnosis. How old were you? I would say my late 20s. So I would probably say like maybe 23, 24. And what was it like growing up with that? Was there a stigma against your your moods? Were, were you afraid to hang out with people because people are going to say, oh, she's moody? No, not really. The funny part is, is um, I really liked school. Um, I was the type that I really enjoyed going because I liked the so- social aspect of it. And I actually call myself a nerd uh, in the sense that I love to learn. Mm-hmm. So I enjoyed going to school. Um, I really didn't notice the changes until senior year. And like I said, I never had difficulties with friends in school. Mm -hmm. Um, I think I was well liked. And so it really wasn't an issue back then. And I really didn't notice the changes until my senior year. Um, I know one time, for example, I just said to my best friends, I'm like, let's just go to Florida. We'll just skip right now and go. And they laugh because I was always a funny person in school. I was actually named the class clown for my senior year. So I think a lot of times when I would make comments like that, they just thought it as me being the class clown where I was being very serious about it. Um, But they never like shied away from me. They never were like, well, we don't want to hang out with her because I was just kind of like the laugh of the party. Mm -hmm. So to them, it was just, hey, she's just being her typical self. Do you feel like when you were the life of the party was a craving to be happy because inside you were extremely sad? Yeah, there were some times where I would use what I would call a mask. So Mm -hmm. I would go to school and just kind of put that mask on. And then other times I would find it very difficult because I felt like I had to change my mask. Like I had to be one way with this person. And then all of a sudden I had to go be this athlete. So I had to change the mask to be in the athlete. And that, to be honest with you, got exhausting after a while. Because again, um, I was feeling sad inside and I spent a lot of time in my bedroom, but I also just covered it up. Mm. So did you speak about it with your friends? Did you say to them that I'm on an off time? Now, once you were diagnosed, you were already past school. Was it college time or post-college? Yeah, at college time. Yeah. Yeah. But definitely during high school, my senior year, no, I didn't say anything to them. I did a lot of like, I said, just kind of hiding in my room. Mm -hmm. Um, I did like to party a lot in high school and, you know, I, I definitely did not, um, I would not classify myself as an alcoholic whatsoever, but I did like to binge drink quite a bit, um, during my high school days and my college days. But like I said, high school, I just hid a lot from people. I, like I said, I would just spend a lot of time in my room. Um, having four brothers is, is awesome, but it also had its downfalls too, because, you know, if I had a problem with a boyfriend or something, their first reaction was, okay, well, let me go beat them up. I was like, that, that's not going to help me. You wonder why I'm single. It doesn't help me, you know, and they meant well, but, and at the time I didn't get along with my mother whatsoever. So Mm. I really didn't have another female to talk to. So that's where it became difficult when I started to notice these changes, especially, and I felt lost at times. And my daddy, who I loved to love, love, he spent a lot of time coaching and he actually worked three jobs to support us. Wow. Um, so I didn't have a very close relationship with him at that point either. So I was just kind of a lost soul, just kind of hanging, trying to hang in there myself. Did your mother accept the fact that you had bipolar? After I was diagnosed, yes. It, um, after I was diagnosed, we finally, I felt, and I think they felt, we finally had answers to my outbursts and also some of the things I did. It was almost relief on our part. Like, okay, mm-hmm. this is why this is happening. This is why she did these things. Mm-hmm. Um, and I've always told people from the beginning, I never, ever use my illness as a crutch. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I take ownership for some of the things I did. I chose to do them. I knew very well what I was doing. Now, some of the stuff, no, I had no control because that's part of the illness. You, you lose control. And I think that's a difficult part for people to understand. I want to, I want to deep dive on that because it's something that fascinates me. It really fascinates me because we are human and we have choices, but then our mind does something that we can't 
take control over what we say, what we do, how we act. So when one is in a relationship or one is in a workplace or something like that, how do we hold them accountable when it's an illness? How do we have the boundaries of this is what we do in the workplace or in the house or in friendships or whatever it is in any relationship versus what our mind is telling us to do and we have no control. Give me a little bit of, a, of, of a, an example of something that you would say, I didn't have control over it. One perfect example would be um, one time um, when I was in college, I was on a mania. So if people don't understand what mania is. Mania is just like this euphoria times 10. Like you just are so high. Um, it, it just, for me, it's a lot of racing thoughts. The best way I describe my mania to people is if you've ever watched a hamster go in that wheel and Mm -hmm. it just keeps turning and Mm -hmm. turn, that's what my brain does. It Mm -hmm. does not stop. And then it goes faster and faster. And I went into the mall and I spent a thousand dollars within 10 minutes Wow! and I just grabbed anything. I didn't even, I mean, I knew what size I was and everything like that, but I was, Oh, I want this. Oh, this is nice. But then when I got home, I mean, it was like, I couldn't control it. I couldn't stop grabbing things. You knew you Um, didn't need it. Exactly. Okay. No, I just wanted it. And I just thought I had all this money in the bank. Which Um, you did not. No. And then when I got home that day, I remember I laid the stuff out. And the only thing that I remember that I bought was the most exciting thing for me was I had bought a different color toothbrush for the day, all all the week. So like I had red was Monday, yellow was Tuesday, Wednesday was blue. And that was so exciting to me. And I remember um, this was before I was diagnosed, but I remember my mom said to me, you know, what the heck is wrong with you? What are you on? Because I was so excited. It was like, I couldn't stop talking. And, wow. and that's another thing for me, the hamster wheel goes and goes, but so do my thoughts and so does me talking. And sometimes the hamster wheel gets so out of control where I can't think about the next sentence because I can't even finish the one I'm on because I'm already trying to start the second sentence. Is this common for bipolar too? For yes. Yes. This is common though. The- I hear a lot about the talking and the, the 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 rambling and and people that live with people with bipolar they have to like know how to keep the boundaries. Okay, you're in mania now, so let's calm you down. But it's really hard to keep that boundary, so it, it becomes a challenge to the person that's living with the person with the mania because how do they take it all in? It's a lot of energy coming out them at them, and they can't really stop it. Yes, yes, that's and you know one thing I want people to understand too is. What my mania is may not be the same mania for another person. And that's where, you know, we have to learn how to accept that as well. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't like people stereotyping mania as just being one thing. For me, for me, mania could be, yes, I have energized bunny. I can get things done, but like I, I can start things and then I can't finish them because I'm going on to the next thing. Right. And then I'm going on to the next. But mania for me, too, also can be where I get very irritable mm. and, you know, pretty much get this anger that comes right. out of nowhere. Right. Um, that's part of mania for me as well. And with but with me, as far as how I cope and manage my bipolar is, I notice for me, I have more manias than I have depression. Oh, wow. So yeah, I experience more manias than I do depression. Also, for me, what happens is what comes up, obviously, is just normal gravity, I guess. It has to come down eventually. So I always start to prepare myself for for when when I'm going to be coming down. The only problem is sometimes I don't know when that's going to happen. I want to go back to my to what I was going to understand because it's something mm-hmm. you're really trying to and maybe there's no answer. So let's say you have an outburst of anger. You're so angry. Your head's exploding. You're throwing things. You're you're saying horrible things to people that you love, and then you're coming down. You're calming mm-hmm. down, you're coming down, and then and then you remember. It's not like you don't remember what you did. You remember clearly. It's not like you're drunk or you're high and you don't remember. You remember right. what you said and what you did, and then you feel terrible. Yes. What's, so you were saying you, you don't use your mental illness as a crutch. How do you feel accountable when it's not you, basically? It, it's your brain taking over your body. Um, for me, that that happened several times, and um, fortunately, the brunt of the person that took most of it was my mother. 
after I learned that it was part of the illness, basically it's just, it was just a matter of me going and apologizing and letting her know that I was having one of those moments, those moods. And, you know, since she got to know me real well, as far as with this illness, I'm very blessed that she could see the difference. Like she could, she could tell, she will know like if I'm having a moment. Right. And so for her, for me personally, it's about educating the per the people or educating who you love right. and letting them know that, Hey, and, and again, it's just taking ownership of it. Yeah. And that's what I would do. I would go back and just say, I'm so sorry. You know, I was having, you know, in a mood swing. And like I said, she was so good about noticing and saying I, that's what I figured it was. So I don't know if that answers your question, but that's yeah, what I basically would do. apologizing mm -hmm. for what you did and taking ownership and saying, I'm really sorry. I didn't mean it. It wasn't me. It was my mind. Now that's all nice and dandy if it's somebody that you really love, like a mother yes. or a sibling. But if it's a principal or somebody, a colleague or something like that, what happens then? Um, as far as that goes, then again, to me, it's about educating the person. I'm all about educating people. So I really haven't experienced that as far as my workplace goes. Um, again, the best part is I'm been able to be in recovery and I've been able to manage the mood swings. So for me, I haven't really experienced any of that, but if I, if I have, it's just a matter of going back, apologizing and explaining and educating the per the person. I think this takes us to a, even a deeper level of not hiding from symptoms and go get diagnosed. Go figure out what is going on with you. People don't people are afraid. What are people gonna think? Shame, stigma, and then they're losing relationships, they're burning bridges because they're not diagnosed. Some when, once they're diagnosed properly, first of all, there are medications that they could take, there's therapies they could do, there's actually behavioral therapy programs that they can go into to make it less effective or less, less, or as you said, notice when it's coming on and say, okay, I'm having, I'm, I, I feel like it's coming on, bear with me. A little bit of preparation. And when people are hiding behind what they're going through and they don't want to get diagnosed, they're basically hurting themselves and everybody around them. I know for like before I went into teaching, I was doing a fitness job, a fitness coordinator um, at a uh, General Motors plant. And that was right after college. So first full-time job. And again, that's when the bipolar had really kicked in. And I do remember I was really struggling at that point with depression. And I remember there were days that I couldn't get out of bed. I couldn't go to work. I would call in and then even at work when I was working there, I was very moody. And I know my boss a few times would just be kind of looking at me because I would snap and at him. And um, and then I remember we had a little shutdown. They have like a little shutdown for winter. And I remember that was the first time I went into the hospital and that's when I was diagnosed. And I got back from the hospital and I was nervous, but I had that talk with my boss at the time and I explained to him where I was and I explained what happened and his response, I thought for sure, I thought, oh gosh, she's going to think I'm crazy. His response was, thank you. He said, thank you for sharing that. He <sighs> said, because I did notice a change and he told me point blank. He said, I'm not going to lie to you. He said, I thought I was going to have to fire you. He said, because you were calling in so much and I noticed such a huge change in you. And I really was getting to the point where I was going to have to let you go. He said, but now that you told me this, it makes sense. And he says, and I appreciate you being open with me about this. And he's like, is there's anything I can do? You know, let me know. So again, it's, wow. it's all about communicating, but you're right. I mean, I almost lost my first job because of the illness, but again, I wasn't diagnosed back then, but then after I was, that's when the recovery started to take place and I had to work on that. 
What a lesson. Guys, if you take anything away from this conversation, which we didn't even start because I want to go into the the, the, the education of mental health in the in in school. But if anybody takes anything away from this episode, it's what you just said. Communicate. Don't be afraid. Don't be shy. The empathy that can come out is outweighs the the hiding behind it, and and you never know. Maybe somebody would say, you know, how many times I say t- tell people, you know, I did, I have, I had depression, anxiety, I would have panic attacks. Or like right away, they would say, my mother, my sister, me, my 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 child. There's right away a connection. I don't think I ever said it to somebody that said, what is that? Like they had mm-hmm. no idea. Yeah. There, there's some kind of a, a um a connection, a bond an understanding. Not everybody understands what it is if they don't go through it. But the judgment is, I don't think I ever got a judgment. I never got mm-hmm. that. Oh, she's crazy. Oh, I can't, I can't deal with her like in a, in a way of, she just told me something and I need to keep my boundaries. So the communication is so essential and so key. Yeah. Uh, and I know when I first came out with it, um, I actually did a, a blog and I posted it on Facebook. Mm-hmm. And, you know, for, you know, for us older people, Facebook is where we go to. Right. And so I posted it and I'm not going to lie, I was nervous. And the comments I got back from old people that I went to mm-hmm. high school was just phenomenal. I mean, they were a lot of, yeah, they were just like, we had no idea in high school. You didn't show anything, you know, we, you know, and then some of them were like, you could have always came to us or, you know, so again, it, it's, you're right. You don't know what reaction you're going to get unless you're very open about it. Right. And not right. all of it's going to be positive. I'm well aware of that. Right. But for me personally, the positives has outweighed the negative by a lot since I've right. been very open about it. Right, right. So what I want to go into now, first of all, I wanted to ask you about your twin. Does he mm-hmm. also have mental illness or some kinds of... No, he does not. Nothing. Nothing. The only thing he gets is, I don't mean to laugh, but the only thing he gets is night terrors. That's it. Wow. Wow. So is that a form of mental illness or not? No, no, no. I just say, I mean, it's, you know, you get nightmares, but that's, yeah, that's the only, and I think a lot of it too, I don't know, might be wrong. I'm not a doctor, but I think maybe too, because we're fraternal and, you know, you have two separate eggs. So I'm not, you know, maybe if he was identical, it would be the outcome would be different. I'm not sure. Right. Okay. Does he have empathy to you? Does he understand what you're going through? Yes. Now he does. He, um, he went to a training um, because he works in the law enforcement and he went into that training, the CIT, which is a crisis intervention right. team. Um, and he was selected. Um, and I, you know, I don't like to use, re- like to throw religion at anybody, but I'm a very faith-based person. And so is he. And, um, I really believe he was chosen to be one of the first people in this class. And they went through that training and he called my mom that night crying and just tell my mom he had no idea what I was experiencing until he went through that training. And it opened his eyes in so many ways. And he just felt bad because, again, a lot, even my family in the beginning just thought I was doing a lot of the stuff for attention. And they just thought I was just being a jerk. And But now he realized it was part of the illness. And so now he's like, one of the first ones I will call. And he sometimes will notice symptoms. Uh, one time I was at his house and I was just having a rough day and I left and I said, all right, well, I'll see you later. He said, okay. And then he called me, I pulling out of his driveway, like not even two minutes later, he's called me. He goes, are you all right? And I just lost it. And I started <gasps> crying. I said, no, I'm having a rough day. And oh, wow. he said, I knew it. He goes, I knew it. I knew it. I knew wow. it. He said, come on, let's talk. So we talk. What a and good so, brother. Yeah. Wow. Wow. So now you yeah. can tell him anything, anytime. Yes. And I have, I have. And you know, it's, you know, just like an, I would hope a person that has empathy for other people, he gets worried, you know, like if I call him and tell him it's a rough day, he'll, mm-hmm. you know, he gets worried, but he is just so much, I really thank God for that crisis intervention team with these law enforcement. Amazing. Because- so I want to take, uh, I want to give a few minutes of a background of mm-hmm. um, how you got hospitalized the first time for your bipolar episode. You were a teacher at the time or not? No, I was um, still the fitness coordinator. You're, okay. So I was, I was back in Buffalo and I had had a, uh, 
probably a serious bout of depression Mm -hmm. and I just couldn't get up, couldn't get out. And, um, one time my mom had to call the crisis intervention team, um, because, you know, I just couldn't get out of bed and I just kept talking about taking my own life. So they came to my house and they had, you know, suggested if it gets worse to check myself in. So I remember it was a Christmas. I don't remember what year, but it was Christmas and I just couldn't stop crying. And Christmas is usually one of my happiest days um, because it's Christmas. I just love Christmas. And Mm -hmm. I just couldn't stop crying. And so I remember what my parents and family didn't know was I had been working too, you know, working full time. And then I was going to grad school part time. But I had also been saving up for my funeral. And they, you know, they didn't know that Um, in, in my mind. So you were serious about it. Yes. In my mind, I was thinking if they had enough money to bury me. Wow. then it would make the pain less for them. And in the back of my mind, I really thought they would be okay after like two or three months. The healing process will be done. They'll be able to move on with their lives. Wow. And so what they didn't know too, um, prior to all that, checking myself in the first time, was I did have one attempt at suicide and oh, it failed. <gasps> yes, and Where it failed. It? Where was it? It was at home. It was I'll know it was um it was a it was a Saturday night and I had been drinking uh like a typical weekend for me and I came home and I had gotten into a fight with a boyfriend at the time mm-hmm. and I remember I was just so upset and I just couldn't handle it anymore. So I took a whole bunch of muscle relaxers that my mom had. I don't know how many, I just dumped them in the palm of my hand and I just swallowed them. And I remember I I went to my room and I remember the room was spinning really fast. And I remember laying on the bed and I was just crying. And I just remember the room spinning. And then I remember it started. Did you tell your mom? Um, I told her later on and I told her, yeah, I didn't tell her right away. No, no. Wow. And then I just remember the room went black and I thought for sure I was gone. And then I woke up the next day. Um, so that Christmas, I made the tough decision. Wait, so uh, your parents oh, didn't even know. I, no. I, I'm still processing this whole Oh, sorry. Thing. Wow. So you happen to have survived by miracle. Yes, I did. Yes, I did. Yes. Your parents didn't even find you half sleeping, half dead. Nope. Nope. You, I was. Did you not take enough? Were you upset? Apparently, apparently not. Apparently not. I mean, I was upset the next morning. Um, yes, the next morning I was upset. Um, the first reaction was not, oh my gosh, I almost took my own life. My first reaction literally was, oh, I was shoot, dumb enough. I'm alive. I'm alive. Yeah, I'm too dumb. I couldn't kill myself right now. <gasps> that, that was my first reaction. Oh my goodness. Yes. That's that's. that's uh, that's horrifying. That's so. It's it's so. I don't know. I, I yeah. I'm processing it. Okay. So so then you woke up. You were upset, and then you said what? So then I just you know I never said a word to anybody about it till like, and I'm talking a few years later. I just held it in. I told. I think I told um my best friend. Okay. Um, I have a group of best friends. Um, but I told them uh, even a few months later. But I really kept it a secret from people. And then that that Christmas, going back to that Christmas, I just sat my parents down Mm -hmm. and I told them, I said, I'm not happy. Mm -hmm. I said, I'm not enjoying life. Mm -hmm. Um, By this point, too, I, you know, they, I think they had an idea because they saw that. But by this point, I was also starting to do self-harm as well um, because I just needed a release and I needed an uh, for me to escape the pain, I would just cut myself. So I think they, I know they saw some of the cuts. So I started going other places that people wouldn't see. Wow. And so I just told them, I said, either I get help or I'm not going to make it. <sighs> I said, I can't keep going on living like this. And so that, that, that evening, my dad and my sister-in-law took me to the hospital and that's when I was checked in. Um, and then that's when I was diagnosed with having the bipolar, with having the bipolar. Wow. Yes. Can I ask you about cutting? 
Sure. You know, I know that um, I'm, a, I'm a part of many groups that deal with mental illness. A lot of them talk about their cuttings and how do they hide it and what should they put on it. And, or once they, they, they change and they did the therapy and they don't need to cut anymore and hurt themselves, they want to hide it. What is the cutting all about? For me, the cutting was the best way I can describe it is the pain, like when you cut and the blood comes out. Mm-hmm the pain's coming with it. That's the way it felt to me. So first time I did it, I did it on my wrist and I did it like three times and the blood just started coming out. And I just, uh, I, I'll never forget. I was sitting on the kitchen floor at my house and the tears just streaming down my face and the blood's going down my forearm. And it was just such a relief. I was like, the pain was escaping. So that's, to me, it's that's why I would cut. visual. Yep. That's why I would cut. It just would help. The pain was going, the pain was escaping through the blood was and it, I felt did better. You feel the physical pain of a cut? No, it was funny because I would feel it, but not, not in the sense where if I did it accidentally, you, you know, it, it, it's weird to describe. I mean, I would feel it, but it was a good pain. You um, weren't afraid of the, no. pain, the physical pain? No. Nope. Do people, nope. do you think people also do it in order f- to bleed to death? Some might do it, it uh, to, unfortunately, take their own life. Yes. Now, I didn't do it that way to take my own life. I just did it to, you know, help relieve the pain that I was going through. So it's a, it's, it's as if you're, you're breathing when you're yes. getting of air. So, so when you see the blood come out, you're breathing. That's a, yes. No air. There's no oxygen. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh, and know. then after, after I'd be done, I would make sure, cause I, I have a little OCD. So I would make sure I cleaned it so it would never get infected. And I'm not going to lie for me after I did it, I would, I would be like, Oh man, why did I do that? Because you're, you know, you left with those scars and that's what I have. I have a ton of scars. Yeah. But, but you know, the reminder, my one blog I did, um, and I came up with a title myself, which I love. And it's called my first tattoo covers my scars, but not my journey. Mm. So on my arm, I have a tattoo that covers up those scars and yeah, it's, it's, it's still part of my journey. I'm not ashamed of it. Right. It's part of my journey. And it also reminds you where you came from and the mm-hmm. work you've done to come so far, mm-hmm. right? And you're yes. covering it up, but you're not hiding it. Exactly. Yeah. It's not so visual and painful for others, but you could see it and you can remember and you can go to that moment. Yes. You were in so much pain and say, wow, look how far I came. Right. Wow. What a powerful thing. I'm stuck in the suicide attempt and this cutting, but... I want to fast forward a little mm-hmm. bit where you are now because I really want to deep dive there for a few minutes yes. before you have to go. So you got, you were hospitalized, you were diagnosed, you went for therapy, you got medicine, you're, you're back on track and you see a psychiatrist, right? Yes. You see a psychiatrist and you feel like your life is getting a little bit more stable. Yes. Okay. When did you decide that you're going into education versus... Um, what you were doing before the training? Um, after seven years of working at the fitness job, I started to become a little bit bored with it because, again, it's just, it was just training people. So um, I already had my teaching license. Mm-hmm. I just couldn't find a teaching job back then. So um, I started applying, and then my sister in law uh, was at a school. She's a guidance guidance director uh, at one of the schools. And so the school she was at had an opening for a health and PE teacher. So she said, why don't you apply? And I did. And um, I was able to get the job. And that's when I moved down to Richmond, Virginia and started my teaching career. Did you tell them right away that you're bipolar? No, I actually was not open with my first school. Like I was open with my colleagues, but not my administration. It was um, after seven years at that school, I was transferred. I put in for a transfer and I was able to relocate at another school. Mm -hmm. And that's when I think I started to really feel very comfortable in my own skin and in my recovery Mm -hmm. to be able to share it more with people. And that's when I was very open with the administration that I'm at the school now so to be- share it with. 
So before you got the job, they knew that you had mental illness. Yes. Uh, uh, my principal and I, we um, seemed to connect really well on our interview. Mm -hmm. We just established a great relationship and that I just felt very comfortable. Um, I'll be honest, I don't even remember the conversation because we talked so much and I just remember being point blank about it. And I just said, you know, I, I cope and I manage with bipolar and I never say my bipolar because I don't own it. It doesn't define right. who I am. Right. And so I remember just sharing. And then one time the guidance counseling, the counseling department um, decided to do these stories and they were the Route 250s. And they asked teachers if they'd be interested in sharing stuff that maybe students wouldn't know. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh my gosh, that would be an opportunity for me to express my mental health. So I did go to my principal beforehand and she knew right away. She mm -hmm. says, you want to talk about your mental health, don't you? I said, yes. She was, that's fine. But there's, we had to, we had to do some parameters um, because of, of teaching and things like that. So the part that I was able to share with my students um, was about how I deal with depression. Mm -hmm. And I just explained to them that what I went through and I said that, you know, I had to get help and I told them not to be ashamed to always ask for help. And then I use these cue cards and I just gave them like three words. I think it was strength, hope and love that got me through everything. And so at the end, though, I said to them, I said, you know, those of you that have had me as a teacher, or those that just know me. If there was a room of 10 people, would you pick me out as the one that has to cope with depression? And the feedback I got from the teachers and the counselor herself said, oh my gosh, these kids' mouths drop. They had wow. no clue wow. that you were dealing with that. They wow. never said, they said, there's no way we would have picked her out. Wow. And but But then when they asked the students, I would say a lot of them, said they could relate to my story because wow. they were dealing with the same thing. And they felt some of them even said, you know, hearing her story makes me feel better because she always has it together and just her smile. And so it was so nice to read, re read the comments and be able to reach out to them and touch them in that way. So special. So, so special. So now yeah, I know that you speak about it with your students some students even came to you and said, Miss Oz, I'm suffering. Um, can you help me? And you're always bringing life to the, to the classroom, but with being strict as well. You have that fine balance of yes. seeing them, letting them express themselves, but still there's the rules, there's respect. And is that something that you think was a trait by you because? of your struggle? Oh, definitely. And I think it was a trait that was in, in uh, I, and I'm not an English person, so is it instilled or installed into me um, by my parents? Um, my dad was a captain in the Marine Corps. Mm -hmm. And before he became a special education teacher, that's where I got my teaching roots from. Mm -hmm. um, and he did two tours in Vietnam. So he would run the household kind of like it was a boot camp. I mean, we were raised with structure and discipline. And that, I think, just became who I am. That's one of my, I would say, one of my attributes to who I am. I've always been very structured and disciplined. But this year, you know, with the mental health, the lesson I did with the students this year was I had them do um, pick a, a mental health illness. And I picked, I think, like five or six of them. And they had to work in groups. And they had to come up with a presentation. And they, they had to answer questions. But what blew my mind, I actually was surprised was what blew my mind was some of the stuff they shared. And I'm talking, I teach middle school. And if anybody knows about middle school, that mm, that's the tough, hardest, tough, tough <laughs> level to teach, not teach, but for them, for them as well. Right. And I'll never forget one student in particular shared her story about how she had to go get help for her depression mm. in front of the whole class. Wow. And not one student made a comment back or ridiculed or anything. And then when I was walking around, like one of the, um, one of the illnesses I chose too was ADHD. A lot of students 
Mm-hmm. do deal with that a lot of students right. one of them was anxiety right and to hear the conversations like some of them would be like oh yeah I deal with anxiety and this is what I do oh wow. I was diagnosed with this this is what I do no this is what what I do I'm telling it was one of the best lessons I ever taught because it opened them up to communicate among themselves right and I shared a little bit of my story before that but just to hear them talk among themselves, and actually be open to each other. Yeah. That makes that's an impact. And that's a you know, I get frustrated with mental health as far as the youth because we have to open our eyes. Yeah. They have to be able to talk about it. We've got to be get more resources for them. It's okay for them to talk about it. There's yeah. still that stigma. Why? Why do you think that a history class is so much more important? We we learn biology. Like right. why don't we talk about mental health and biology. I I have no idea. I really don't. And I wish, you know, history shows, I mean, I could be way off. So I'm not a history teacher, but if I, if, if I'm incorrect and I apologize, but I thought I, I learned that or someone had during my research, like Abraham Lincoln, I think they said even George Washington. Um, I do believe they said Albert Einstein. All three of them dealt with some type yes, of mental illness. Absolutely. So huge leaders. It, huge leaders. Yes. And, yes. And there's a whole um, article that came out about that big achievers have to go through. I think it's bipolar because their mania is what gets them to get excited about their dream. Right. The average person that doesn't have the mania can't even get there to dream about it. Right. So the big inventors and, and leaders, a lot of them have bipolar. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and that's what, yeah. And that's what we need to, you know, and, and, and I want people to understand with this illness, it is not an easy road. It, it has not been an easy road for me. And it's not going to be an easy road. But I'll be honest with you, it was the second, you know, second hospitalization that took me to accept that this illness is going to be with me. Once I accepted it, mm-hmm. that's when I started to really achieve things. That's when I really started opening up. Mm-hmm. That's when I started to stay on my treatment plan. I'm very vocal about my treatment plan too. I make sure that I communicate with my doctors. Yeah. Um, and, you know, so again, it's I've been able to achieve such great things. And, and I really do contribute having this illness put that fire under me. Mm-hmm. And make me help me achieve these things and change lives along the mm-hmm. way because you're with young children that are just starting off their life and maybe they're dying inside from shame or fear or not even knowing what they're feeling because no one talks about it in school. Right, and I tell I tell my students I'm like at any point if you need somebody to talk to, my door is always open. You know, I'm like my expectations are here. I know I only set them because I know you can reach them, but I've always said to them, please do not think at that just, I may be hard on you, but I'm always here for you if you need anything. And like I said, I've, you know, I've, I've had a few come to me and we've had talks and I've helped them get through some of their anxiety. I mean, I'm not a doctor, so I'm not going to talk anything about medication with them because I'm, I'm not a doctor. But I try to give them some coping skills maybe they can use. Or even sometimes a lot of them just want to talk. And they just want you to listen. And sometimes some of them just want a hug. And the hug can get them through that day. So, and that's, I mean, that's free. I mean, what's, I love, I love hugging my students. Sometimes some of them are like, please. I'm like, oh, no, give me a hug. (laughs) (laughs) Wow. And what are the other teachers saying about you talking about it? Is there a stigma over there? Do you feel that there's a little bit? No, I actually work at a school that we are like a family. And I, and that's why I think makes it easier for me to be open about it is I just feel really the warmth from them. And, you know, some of them will say to me, you know, they will hear my story. They'll read my blogs. Um, I actually had one. We went to a conference and um, she teaches at a different middle school. And we were walking to one of our sessions and she said to me, you know, 
I just got to say those blogs you write are just awesome. She was, I read every one of them and that's, yeah. you know, you've really opened my eyes on a lot of things because I deal with some anxiety and just reading your stuff, you know, so uh, that's one thing about my school that I am so blessed. I have not had any negative from any of the faculty or any of the, and some of the parents have been very um, open and very kind to me and just thanking me. So it is, you know, knock on wood and God bless. It's been great so far. It's amazing. And I think this should be a lesson to so many schools out there and leaders, principals, leaders to open the conversation because not only is it not bad, it's safe. Mm Mm-hmm. Because mm-hmm. these little kids can go for help if they need help. Who knows if you prevent suicide or or thoughts of suicide or hurting themselves like you went through. Mm-hmm. Who knows if you would have a easier journey to diagnosis if, if there was a conversation about it in school. Right. Oh, definitely. Definitely. Because I remember when I was in school, I don't think it was talked about at all. At and all. I, you know, and I've had a friend, um, unfortunately be successful in taking his own life. Mm-hmm. And when anyone that has to deal with anyone losing someone to suicide, it is just one of the worst pains you will ever have to go through. Mm-hmm. And that's and that's why I do my stories and that's why I'm out there prom- you know promoting as far as opening up because of his situation, you know. Right. Um he just didn't have unfortunately didn't have the strength to hang on and so I do a lot of it for him and for his memory too. Mm-hmm. What is your mission? Uh, my mission is just to still be, keep uh, fighting the stigma and just keep being open with my story. And my main thing is I want people to see that because I have to, you know, cope and manage with this illness, you could still be successful. And, you know, and I've had quite a few successes in, you know, in my career. I was, you know, the teacher of the year already. And then I was actually named the health and PE teacher for the secondary um, schools for the whole county. Wow. Um, and that's even with my specialists knowing that I manage and cope with bipolar. And so um, and currently I'm writing a book. It's a, it's a book in progress. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm hoping one day maybe that will get published. But I'm just, I won't stop. I'm just so passionate about letting people see I'm in recovery every day. Mm-hmm. And I, and maybe some people don't see it the same way, but I feel like with same thing with someone that maybe is a recovering alcoholic or someone that's, uh, you know, dealing with drug addiction, I still have to fight right. no matter what. And I have to fight every day. Right. And this is something that um I can't control at times. And my, one of my biggest complaints with people maybe not understanding is There's not an on and off switch in my brain. Mm -hmm. My brain just works different than other people sometimes. Mm -hmm. And that's, and I, you know, when it does, I use the coping skills that I, that I know and that I've learned. Um, But yeah, I'm not going to be quiet about this because especially with our youth, we need to, we need more resources and we need to let them understand it's okay to feel the way you feel sometimes, Mm -hmm. but now they've got to be able to find sources and people to go to that can help them. Are you, do you have a dream of creating a program just like a fitness program or a health program that a program in school for mental health? I would love to have, we do teach, you know, we do have um, a lesson on mental health. Um, I would love to be able to collaborate with someone and that would be a great dream to happen. I'm just not sure where to start with that. Um, Right now, I'm trying to have the lesson that I've done. I'm got to tweak it a little bit, and I'm going to send it to the one of the ladies in the VDOE, which is the Virginia Department of Education. I want her to look at it because she had mentioned to me um, to send her what I had done because if it's you know if it's a great lesson or whatever she thinks, and she might uh, be able to publish it to be used as part of the curriculum. So, but I would, I would love to be able to just, we're making tiny steps in in the right direction, but I just feel like you're right. We need bigger. And I'm just not, I would love it. I'm just not sure where to start or whom to start it with, but yeah, I would love to do something like that. 
So any of your listener, any of the listeners out there, if anybody has to drive like Tammy and would like to work with Tammy or has ideas or is a teacher or a leader or something like that, maybe we can get some minds together from the listeners to make something. Maybe this this episode will inspire somebody to start even small. Everything starts with small. Everything starts with a small little change. So who knows? Maybe. So we'll we'll put Miss Oz's information down below that we can maybe think together and do something in the from the bottom up versus being already uh, an adult and not have the conversation. What age do you think is appropriate to start talking mental health? Oh, I would say even elementary school age. Elementary, you would have to do it very simple. You know, maybe talk about sadness and, and things like that. And then obviously progress your way up. But we need to start hitting these kids when they're young because you've got elementary students that are experience anxiety, believe it or not. Yeah. You know, and that's it that's that's a shame, I think, at that age they're experiencing anxiety already. Right. And 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 deep sadness. Mm-hmm. Or mood swings like you went through and didn't mm-hmm. understand why or to know exactly. that there's a way to control it or to to diagnose it properly. That they right. feel odd or they have to hide from themselves or something like that. So right. yeah, I agree. I think it needs to be a conversation from from very young about how do we feel, talk about the way we feel. Whatever it is, being mm-hmm. okay to share that we're not happy, dancing, everything is okay. Just right. To, just to start over there, that share what you feel and obviously also to teach who is it safe to share with. Yes, yes. I don't, I hate when either eat young kids, adults, teens, whomever, you know, I just want people to feel that there's a safe outlet to go somewhere because, you know, I'm very blessed that I have a family that supports me with all this now. Um, Again, it wasn't an easy journey. I think you said it earlier. I think personally, it's a lot harder on the caretakers Mm -hmm. than it is on me um, to as far as trying to help me and things like that. But I'm blessed that I have a family that is there to help me. Some people, unfortunately, don't have that. And I would love for them to find other avenues or outlets to get the help that they need. Mm -hmm. Can you give a tip or two to those that um, struggle with bipolar or any mental health, how not to feel a victim? There's two words that I use and the two words are, you know, tattooed on my arms. I have the one arm says strength and the other one says hope. Um, Those are the two words that get me through some days that if I feel like, let's say I'm having an off day, I just look at my arms. Um, not to give up. Do not give up on yourself. It It is not an easy road. And there's going to be days, you know, that you may want to give up. But there's got to be that power inside of you, that fight that you're going to get through it. And as far as not being a victim, you've got to associate yourself with people that truly care. Mm-hmm. This illness has taught me that maybe people are not going to stick around because it is not for the weak. Mm-hmm. Um, some people cannot handle it. Therefore, right. if you lose people, then you lose people. You've got to associate yourself with positive people and people that are going to stay in your corner. I tell mm-hmm. people, even if I'm having a bad day, I don't need you to talk sometimes. You just sitting next to me mm-hmm. and putting your arm around me or even just sitting next to me, that's all I need sometimes. And you know, my nickname, Oz, if you think, if you go back to the Wizard of Oz, Oz. it means great and powerful. Wow. And that's, you know, my actually one of my administrators, my principal, um, gave, bought me a shirt and it says, the great and powerful Oz has spoken. And <laughs> we laugh about it, but that's the Oz and the Wizard of Oz was the great, great and powerful. Right. So that's the way I look at myself sometimes is, you know, I am that person that, I mean, I know, I mean, I sometimes say, well, I don't want to sound cocky, like I'm great, but sometimes that's what I need to feel. And and yeah. sometimes I feel like my words can be powerful to people right. to right. help them get through. So they need to associate themselves with positive people. And like I said, the two words that mean the most to me are strength and hope. And that's what I use those two words every day in my life just to get me through the day. And even if I'm not having an off day, 
just those two words alone is what I use to get me through every day of my life. Wow. Wow. And do you ever feel, why me? In the beginning, I did. In the beginning, I was like, why me? Come on, why? No, now I don't. Because I have used this such as a blessing that, again, like I told you, I feel like if I was not dealing with this, I might not have been able to achieve everything that I have. And it has, it has really put a fire under me. So that whole why me has gone out the door. Now it's what, what can I do with this? Do you still go to therapy every day? I mean, not every day, but on a constant <laughs> basis. Yes. Oh, yeah. I said yes. that as a Freudian. <laughs> one of my dreams are, I said, if I ever win the lottery, it would be to go to therapy every single day, but not the same therapist. I would have different therapists, like uh, emotional therapy, relationship therapy, kids therapy, um, uh, self-therapy. Like it would be, yeah. so it would, that's my dream to be in therapy every single day. So I was a little bit of a projection there, but you are you still in therapy? Oh, yes. Yes, I go to, I go to individual therapy and then... Um, I help facilitate a group therapy. Oh, wow. Where is that? That's um, in one of the local hospitals. Um, I work with NAMI, which is the National Alliance on, National Alliance on Mental Illness. Mm -hmm. So I work with them in Central Virginia, and I help co-facilitate a support group along with doing um, In Your Own Voice, which is a training I went through, and I go to psychiatric hospitals and me and another co-presenter we share our story so guys listen to this she tammy miss oz she struggles but she she gives while she struggles she's not a victim even when we struggle we give we give because that gives us back that gives us power that gives us hope that gives us a sense of why we should live so tammy is running or walking what are you running running walking for nami um i'm running you're running. She's running. Yeah. I'm going to run slash maybe walk a little. <laughs> okay. Can we put the link below if anybody wants to support you? Even $2, $3, yes. $5. Yes. If you enjoy this episode and you want to support Tammy and be a part of her giving back, we're going to put the link. If you could send it to me, we'll put it in the, in the, okay. in the show notes because I just found out about it yesterday that she's yes. running and I'm so proud of her. So proud of her. Yes I'm, NAMI is huge. Be, yes, I'm actually going to be one of the uh, guest speakers, too, in the beginning of the race. I want to be there. I want to hear it. You should fly out. Oh, so phenomenal. <laughs> so, guys, listen, when you're battle, look for someone to give to when you're on the up. I'm not saying when you're down, you can give. When you're down, you sometimes need to receive, receive. I, you know, when you were saying about sometimes you need somebody sitting near you on a mm -hmm. bad day, not even talking. This morning, I saw the Winnie the Pooh. Um, you saw, you know, that little thing with Winnie the Pooh and Piglet and he said, I'm yes. having a hard day. It's one of my favorite, favorite all time, <laughs> all time, all time, little, what do you call it? Like a, a memo yes. um, saying I'm having a bad day. So he says, and then says, what are you doing? He said, I'm just sitting near you. You don't have to yep. gonna sit by mm -hmm. your side. And people yep. that don't go through mental health don't get that. No, they don't. I'm not here to, to no, no them or whatever. It just, it's something that I didn't get. Why would right. you just sit near me? I'm so boring. I'm like, <laughs> and not only boring, I'm painful. I have a hard time sitting near people that are suffering because I, I get that energy and I'm like, no, I want to be alive. I want to be happy. I want to be. But it takes power to just sit, just be with somebody without understanding, without digging into it. Just be. Just. Mm -hmm. So when you were saying, I was imagining this morning, I saw that. And I'm like, oh, one of my favorite, the, the Winnie the Pooh and Piglet. Oh, they have the, they actually, a lot of people can learn from their relationship. I mean, yeah. to be honest with you, but, and that's, again, that's communicating with people and letting them know. And that's what I've told people, like my family and my friends. I'm like, if I'm having a bad day, this is what you need to do. And I tell them, you know, sometimes it's a matter of just give me space. Right. My mom and I have a real good and when my daddy was alive, we had a good connection of if I was having a rough few days or just rough days, my mom would say, I would tell her, I don't feel like talking. She said, that's fine. But just text me and say, having a bad day, but I'm okay. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's what, what we learned. And that's what I'll do this way. You know, I, you know, I think for them and for maybe anybody else that's listening, you know, when someone tries to take their own life, 
I don't think, I think in the back of the, my, my family's mind, that's never going to go away. They're always going to, I think, be scared of that. I and agree. so that's the reassurance I give them by just saying, having a, having a bad day, but I'm okay. And my mom right. says that's all she needs. And then right. she's, she, you know, she feels much better. Right. And if you're not okay, tell them I need you to do yes. X, Y, Z. Yes. Don't say you're okay just in order to protect them because right. for the long term, that's not good. No. But I feel like it's a matter of respect. They're mm-hmm. there for you. Respect them, share with them, bring them in, update them. It's also giving back to them. Like, yes. Yeah. Instead of just hiding, it's a hard, it's a hard illness to deal with, mm-hmm. to be a caretaker. So give them respect and, and share with them. Yeah. And I don't, and I firmly believe people cannot help you unless they know what you're going through. Right. And if, unless you verbalize what you need. It, Exactly. Right. And only you know, even sometimes we don't really know, but if anybody knows, it's us. Right. You know? Right. So when you said that you had a tattoo, that one of them was hope, I mm-hmm. had the chills because you know that hope is everything. And that's why I named this podcast Hope to Recharge. Mm-hmm. And I always, I, my, my number one question that I ask everybody at the end of the podcast is what does hope mean to you? Hope to me means just being alive for me, just means being alive and just being able to stay in my recovery. I mean, that's, that's hope for me. And just hope is just for me to continue this journey and to be able to help as many people as I can. And my hope, I hope totally uh, uh, off the subject of that. um, One of my hopes is to Meet Jimmy Guapolo from the 49ers. He's a quarterback. Guys, if anybody <laughs> out there knows how to do that, contact Miss Oz, t- a.k.a. Tammy. That would be like a big pay it forward moment, right? Um, yes, but no, hope. And like I said, hope and strength are just the two words that, you know, and then the last word I would use for people, I would say is hope, strength, and love. Mm-hmm. because yeah. I've got, it's been a long journey for me to even love myself. Mm-hmm. Um, but I need that love from people back as well. And those three words is what I use every day to get me through my days. Wow. Wow. I, I want to ask you so many more questions, but you need to go. Mm-hmm. And maybe we'll have you on again once your okay. book comes out. But I, I can't thank you enough for sharing your your very hard journey, but extremely successful and for giving hope to so many out there and for giving me hope for education by, by me connecting with you and me having children that are going through education. Sometimes I, I, I die inside and I'm like, oh my God, I hope they're going to survive the education. And, and, and I, I have hope that people like you and, 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 um, places like bring change to mind that they're trying to bring programs to schools start from young so i do have hope that one day they'll start talking about mental health health and awareness in schools when they're young and we'll educate and we'll we'll prevent so many illnesses not illnesses really because you can't prevent but maybe for escalating and right side and pain yes and, and and disconnections and people running away from home or or people sending kids away because they can't deal with them or they don't know how to deal with them. There's so many sad stories. So I do have hope that Yes, and I and I hope oops, sorry. Yeah, yeah no, 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 I hope, no, and I just hope too, you know, yeah, give the give the caretakers hope too and give them the tools that they need to be able to help them through mm-hmm. these situations. You know, being a teacher, I, I wouldn't trade it for the world. It's a it's one of these rewarding jobs and but I mean, teaching them health and PE, I want them to learn for me. Trust me. I want them to learn nutrition and, and I want them to learn how to play these sports and, mm-hmm. and team sports and all that. But my main job in that classroom is I just want them to come to a place that they have some, somebody that cares about them. When they leave my classroom or they leave me for that year, like especially eighth grade, I, when they move up, I want them to look back and be like, you know what? Ms. Oz cared. And if they don't remember the five components of fitness, I'm okay with that. I want them to walk away and be like, but she cared. And I'm sure they do. Thank you. I wish I had you as a teacher. All right, there we go. (laughs) (laughs) I wish I did. Where can people reach you? 
What do you have? Well, my, a lot of my blog writings are done with when you had your, the former guest of yours was Ann Moss Rogers. So mm-hmm. a lot of, all my blogs are on the, um, her, her website, which is the um, emotionallynaked.com. Um, but I don't really have a blog myself yet. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, so they can just, um, I could be more than happy, you know, when we're done, I can leave my email address. If they have any questions or anything, I'd be more than happy to give you uh, a link or add to the link, my email address, if that'll help. Yeah. You could say it here now. Oh, okay. It's T whammy W H A M M Y with the number eight at AOL.com. Okay. That's going to be in the show notes. So if you have any questions about your children, she'll try her best. She's very busy. She's really busy. (laughs) It was not easy getting her on the show. I just want you to know it was not easy, but I was really, I I had to cancel the other day because I had a family issue with my baby and she was so gracious. And and I know that school starting in a week Mm -hmm. and a half and she is super busy meetings to kazoo her own life. And she made time for this. So I want you all to thank her with me for making time for us and for for sharing this very important message about educating from young, not giving up, for trying again. You fall, get up, walk, don't be a victim. So many lessons in this in this episode. Thank you so much, Miss Oz. I can't wait to meet Thank you. Thank you. When is the when is the marathon? The walk is October fifth. Oct where? Uh in Richmond, Virginia. It's over at Innsbruck. Is it on a Saturday? Yes, it's a Saturday morning. Oh, darn. I can't come on a Saturday. Oh. I'm a Sabbath observer. So oh, yeah, yeah, so I can. But I'll cheer you on from far okay. from New York. All and right. again, if anybody wants to donate even a dollar, it goes towards mental health to help those that are really struggling and they don't have a support like some of us do have. Yeah, and if anybody wants to donate, they can just email me at the... Um email address that I gave and then I could share the link with them that way or it's, or else I'm on Facebook because that's where I have it posted is on Facebook. I'm going to put it actually on the show notes. Oh, perfect. Thank yeah. you. Okay. Thank you so much. Thanks for your time. I'm so excited we got to do this and I can't wait where we're going to be next year. Oh, I know. They'll be very exciting. Yeah. 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 So, so thank you everybody for listening. Thank you for tuning in. This was such a powerful episode. I don't know why my energy, I feel like I need to run now. Like I feel so <laughs> energized from you. I mean, hey, I was at the gym at six o'clock this morning. I got my workout in already. Well, I was not. <laughs> <laughs> so I feel like I really need to run because I feel like you really gave me adrenaline, like of Thank you. hope, an adrenaline of hope. So if you want to connect with us, you can go to hope to recharge.com or connect with us on Facebook, Hope to Recharge the Community. We would love to hear your feedback. If you're listening on iTunes, please don't forget to leave a review, especially about the lovely Tammy and how important it is to bring mental health to early education and up till the moment we leave this world when we're 120. So thank you, everybody. See you next time. Hope you have a wonderful rest of the day. Thank you for joining us and taking the time to listen. I really appreciate it. Please hit the subscribe button so you can hear further episodes. If you are listening to us on iTunes, please leave feedback and ratings below. Let us know if there's any topic that you would like to hear from us in the future. Bye till next time.